Good afternoon. We're going to begin Lesson 66, The Latter Rain, The Pouring Out of the Holy Spirit. As we get into this lesson, you're going to find out that the Holy Spirit from the day of Pentecost was always poured out. But uh, we're going to see in this lesson from 1901 on, it's going to be the latter rain. It's going to really pour down on everybody in the world. So with that, let's pray before we get into this important lesson. We love you, Lord. We praise you. You're a mighty God. Asking in your name, Jesus, teach us, guide us, show us the way, Lord. Help me to say what you want. Help them to hear what you want. Help us all to obey all your word, to get into your word, to understand your word, and to obey it, Lord. We're asking in your name. We love you. We praise you forever and ever in your name. Amen. And we begin this lesson. I am showed this before, but it says a formal rain and a latter rain. And in the last days, this was on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and says, In the last days, say, God, I'm going to pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter was uh, quoting Joel 2.28. Here it was in Acts. And the people were saying, hey, these people are acting like they're, they're drunk. And he says, uh, no, this is but the third hour of the day. And he says, in the last days, he gives this prophecy and he tells them, God's going to pour out his, his spirit upon all flesh. As we start going through this, we're going to see that it started in 1901. But today, people are speaking in tongues in every church now. Uh, every Christian church, let me say that. And I'm not speaking religion. I'm speaking uh, those that are in Christian churches that are following Jesus. And, of course, the form of rain, and through time we went through the Dark Ages where the Catholic Church started teaching one false doctrine after another. What prompted that? Well, in 325 A.D., Constantine, the emperor of Rome, uh, <coughs> he presided over a council a council at night, the Nicene Council, and at this council, they came up with, uh, we are not going to worship one God, we're going to worship three gods in, in one God. And they define that there are three divine persons in one God. The Father's a person, the Son's a person, the Holy Spirit's a person. Anybody with any logic could start saying, well, Father's a spirit and he's a person. Yes, the Son is a person. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, and he's a person? <clears throat> no, no, no. Uh, they got it wrong from the beginning. But this, as soon as that doctrine came into effect, a new baptism came into effect. And it was baptism in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. The Catholic Church took one scripture, Matthew 28, 19, and instead of doing what it said, they repeat it every time... Uh, they are baptizing someone. And of course, it says, uh, go into all world baptizing in the name. That's what they leave out of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. The name of the Father is Jesus. The name of the Son is Jesus. The name of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. So we see this error that causes one false doctrine after the other. And then we see Luther. He broke away from the Catholic Church. And then later we see Wesley breaking away. These are two remarkable men. Uh, Luther started the Reformation. Wesley, uh, they were speaking in tongues. It was kind of like the first great movement of God moving on people, uh, again, in different places in the world, and they were speaking in tongues. And of course, uh, receiving the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues is the latter rain. It began 1901 in Topeka, Kansas. Let's take a look at it. 1901, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Here we are, 1901, Topeka, Kansas. The 20th century Pentecostal movement started with Charles Parham in 1901, a faith healing preacher who started Bethel Bible College in Topeka, Kansas. His followers were unusual in that they prayed for all their needs or they went without. That's faith. 
In his Bible college, a question arose concerning whether the receiving the Holy Ghost was always accompanied by speaking in tongues. In studying the Bible, this, this question arose, and uh, he didn't know how to answer that, and so he asked them to study it out. After prayerful study, they concluded that speaking in tongues always accompanied the receiving of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. A lot of people may be surprised at this because they, there are so many churches out there who are wrongfully telling their people that when you believe, you've got the Holy Ghost. That is incorrect, not backed up by the Bible. There's uh, scriptures, there's instances, there's examples in the Bible where you can go in where a person received the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. Right there, that should be telling us something that uh, how do we know we've got the Holy Ghost? There's evidence. You start speaking in tongues. Um, <laughs> it's a, when you're speaking baptism in Jesus' name, if people can't figure that out in the Bible because there's so many scriptures on it, uh, I don't know. Uh, they're not going to see anything, I don't believe. But speaking in tongues, that's a hard one to understand because you have to have faith that a miracle will happen to you. It's a little bit harder to get across from, but there's scripture after scripture after scripture. And I found out that if you read those scriptures again and again and again, your faith's going to start building up and you too can receive the Holy Ghost. And you have to because we're going to see that this develops into a fact that uh, this is part of the salvation that God has provided mankind. And you've got to do that in order to be saved. A few days before the end of 1900, they held services day and night and began seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, expecting to speak with other tongues. On New Year's Day 1901, a student, Agnes Osman, asked her instructor, Charles Parham, to lay hands on her that she might receive the Holy Ghost and she began speaking in tongues. This event birthed the Pentecostal movement of the 20th century. In the days and years ahead, many other students and 12 ministers from other faiths all were speaking in tongues. This wasn't the first time people spoke in tongues, but it was the first time in modern times that believers sought to receive the Holy Ghost with the expectation of speaking in other tongues. Uh, there's a lot of people still today think, well, if God wants to give me the Holy Ghost, he'll, he'll give it to me. They won't even open their mouth. Well, Speaking in tongues requires you to be speaking. And uh, you've got to be speaking in order for that to happen. But you've got to seek him too. And if you seek him, you will find him. There's scripture for that. News of people receiving the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in tongues rapidly spread from Kansas, Missouri to Texas, where W.J. Seymour heard about this spirit outpouring and took the message to a small church in Los Angeles. He heard about this, went over to Los Angeles, and we have the great Azusa Street Revival. <clears throat> in 1906, you see it, Azusa Street. In this small church in Los Angeles, W.J. Seymour's text was the second chapter of Acts. Although he had not received the Holy Ghost baptism, he preached that speaking in tongues was the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. He had seen it in the Bible. He was locked out of the church, but a sympathetic onlooker took him into his home. So he started preaching, and they didn't want him back. He was locked out. <coughs> he was now in a person's home. After several days of prayer meetings in the home, people became hungry for God's blessings. On April 9, 1906, six people were gloriously filled with the Holy Ghost. Hundreds came to see what was happening, and the city was stirred. Azusa Street is coming alive. On April 12, Seymour received the Holy Ghost. They had three services, seven days a week, uh, were being held. Uh, it was seven days a week. It's like the uh, Tabernacle of David. It was 24-7. Uh, uh, around the clock, they were having services. Of course, they just had these services in the daytime, but seven days a week. 
a powerful move of God because people were now receiving the Holy Ghost. They knew they had because they were speaking in tongues. Soon the great crowds required larger accommodations and the ser services were moved to a former uh, African Methodist church on Azusa Street. For three years, this church sustained a mighty revival. The secret of the revival was prayer. And of course, they were reading the Bible and they, they were seeing this. They were not only seeing it, they believed it and they received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Uh, people came from all over the world. In 1911, William A. Durham discovered that there were not three separate works of grace, but one combined. A common expression in those days was, I'm saved, <laughs> one, sanctified, two, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, they were believed, a lot of them, when all you have to do is believe you're saved at that point. Uh, nothing in the Bible to verify that. Sanctified, the sanctification doesn't come till you receive the Holy Ghost and then God starts working within you. And being filled with the Holy Ghost, they put that last as, um, it was kind of all confusing, but they were just getting into the scriptures and they were trying to see what, what is God doing? What is all this about? Durham advocated salvation to be an inward work a change of heart, a change of nature, and thus one work. So William Durham uh, realized it wasn't three separate things. It was one work that all came at the same time. Uh, studying now, you can see the justification, um, regeneration, the fact that we are born again, uh, adoption, we become adopted children of God, and the uh, final one, I'm trying to think, well, salvation, okay? Uh, all these happen at the same time, and sanctification progresses from that. It's, it's a process that starts at the time that we are born-again Christians. Now we go to the formation of Pentecostal doctrines, uh, denominations. Seymour, along with Parham, could well be called the co-founders of world Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism starts. One of the first was Gaston Barnabas Cashwell of North Carolina. He spoke in tongues in 1906. He saw several holiness denominations swept into the new movement, including the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, Church of God in Cle Cleveland, Tennessee, the Pentecostal Holiness Church, the Fire Baptized Holiness Church, and the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist Church. In 1906, Charles Harrison Mason journeyed to Azusa Street and returned to Memphis, Tennessee to spread the Pentecostal fire in the Church of God in Christ, which is the largest Pentecostal denomination today. William H. Durham of Chicago spread Pentecostalism throughout the Midwest and Canada, and his finished work theology of gradual progressive sanctification led to the formation of Assemblies of God um, in 1914. So we, we, this finished work is the fact that there's one uh, part of salvation, not three as they originally believed. When we are born again, uh, we have to believe, we have to repent, we have to be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost with the evidence speaking in tongues. We are born again at that point we enter God's church, and at that point, we begin this, uh, we are able to start this uh, progressive sanctification. We, we go through this process. We had to have the Holy Spirit within us in order to even start this. But once he's in us, he begins this, this process. Ian Bell and Howard Goss called churches together to form an organization teaching the Pentecostal experience. The first general council of the Assemblies of God convened with Bell as chairman. Many other lead leaders founded churches worldwide like Ivan Voronov, a Baptist preacher, established the Pentecostal movement in the Soviet Union. Mary Rumsey, an American missionary to Japan and Korea, uh, 
Paul Yungi Cho began the Yodi Full Gospel Church, which had eight, 830,000 members in 2007 in Korea, South Korea. By the end of the 20th century, Pentecostals were expected to be the largest family of Protestants in the world. The first wave of Pentecostalism established a classic Pentecostal movement with more than 14,000 Pentecostal denominations with the development of worldwide missions which includes the United Pentecostal Church. The second wave was the penetration of Pentecostalism into the mainland Protestant and Catholic churches as a charismatic renewal, movements with the aim of restoring the historic churches. A part of this movement was the Neo-Pentecostal movement, which began in 1960 in Van News, California, under the ministry of Dennis Bennett, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal Anglican Church. In 1999, another part was a Catholic charismatic renewal movement, 90 million in 120 countries. Catholics started receiving the Holy Ghost had its beginning in Pittsburgh in 1967 among students and faculty at D Duquesne University. After spreading rapidly among the students at Notre Dame and the University of Michigan, the movement spread worldwide. Now, in, we can see Protestant leaders include Tommy Tyson Rose, uh, Ross Whitstone in the Methodist Church, uh, Birk, Bradford, Rodham, Williams, and Brad Long in the Presbyterian, Pat Robertson, Howard Canister, Ken Pagard, and Gary Clark Baptist, Everett, Terry Fulham, and Charles Fulton in the Episcopalian Church, Gerald Durstein and Nelson Litwire in the Mennonites, and Vernon Stoop in the United Church of Christ. I may have got those names a little bit wrong, but the, it was starting to spread, the charismatic movement. Uh, the third wave of the Holy Spirit originated at the Fuller Theological Seminary in 1981 under the classroom ministry of John Wimber, founder of Association of Vineyard Churches. This wave comprised mainland evangelicals who experienced signs and wonders, but who disdained labels such as Pentecostal or charismatic. In 1999, the number 33 million members, they numbered 33 million members worldwide. Pentecostals produced many evang evangelists known for mass healing crusades. Uh, Oral Roberts, Catherine Kuhlman, Pat Robertson, pa Paul Crouch, uh, Jim, Jimmy Swaggart, and Jim Baker. In the late 1970s, a newer movement of faith teachers drew national attention. Some of these were Kenneth Copeland, Fred Price, Kenneth Hagin, uh, Senior, and Richard Bonk, and Oral Roberts. And now we're moving on to uh, the instruction of the Spirit, uh, the receiving of the Spirit of God, and, and the many things that they learned in that, which I'm going to start that next week. But uh, you can see that it started rapidly. It just one person in 1901, and quickly it started moving all over the United States, Canada, and then worldwide. We thank you, Lord, for helping us see through history what you had promised. There was going to be a former rain and a latter rain. And from 1901, we've, we've started to see that latter rain coming down mightily. And even up to our present, we're seeing your spirit fall in all churches. And we're so thankful to be able to witness that. Help us to see it, Lord. Help us to see it in your word. Help us to preach it, to teach it, so people understand you've got to receive the Holy Spirit. And God will give you evidence. He will give you, allow you to speak in tongues. You're going to know when you've received it. Once it's, you've received it, you know your life is going to change. God is going to work a miracle in you, and you've got to believe that. Uh, man cannot tell you you've got the Holy Ghost. You've got to expect God to work a miracle in you, and you, then you will know it isn't from man, it's from God. So thankful for what God has given me. Thank you, Lord. In your name, amen.